So let's start with a quick word of prayer. Father, we do thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to come to you this evening to open our hearts to receive your word and to put it into practice. Father God, I just uh, pray that you'd hide me behind the cross. Use um, these words uh, to glorify yourself. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd be honored and glorified as these words go forth and are empowered, that we might live a victorious life, a powerful life in faith, that you might be glorified in all things. In Christ's name, amen. So uh, I've titled this uh, Sleeping Safely in the Storm. And it's because as Christians, we will, without a doubt, if we have any level of faith whatsoever, approach things in such a way that we're going to have opposition. So the story comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 down through 41. It says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Okay, And now when they had left the multitude, he took uh, him along uh, in the boat as, as he was, and, an, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, and it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea do obey him? Now this is early in the disciples' life and walk with Christ. There's actually several accounts in Scripture that talk about a stormy sea and Christ coming in, into that area and those were, uh, he was calming the sea. There's a couple different instances. This is the first instance. And what I want to do is challenge us at our core in terms of what this means in our own steps of faith. Because when we come across something that God leads us into, usually the first step of faith, as I've heard it said, is a step of fear. But I don't believe that. I believe, biblically speaking, that the first step of faith is a step of courage. And so Jesus calls, uh, uh, calls knowing the dangers that are waiting for us, just like what we saw in this picture. Now, he is omniscient. He understands everything in advance. He sees things way in advance. So when he called the disciples into that boat, he knew there was going to be a storm out there. And so he calls us, knowing what dangers lay ahead of even us. And Jesus calls us out of our comfort zone. We cannot serve him in a comfortable place. We have to get discomforted, uncomfortable, moving forward for his glory. We may think that God isn't concerned when we get into dilemmas and we get into problems of life when we run across obstacles. We may think that God isn't concerned, but that isn't the case at all. But he is powerful to overcome the storm. And that's the thing that we really have to bank on. So I want to break this down kind of uh, uh, piece by piece. Let's start with this whole aspect of let us cross over. Okay, Jesus calls knowing the dangers waiting ahead. Now that's a scary thought because we don't know the next second of our life. We may t be taking our last breath tonight sometime. We have no clue what the future holds for us. And yet he knows everything. He knows the beginning from the end. He has planned our life out for us. And if we're smart in our faith, we put our life in his hands, not just the eternal life where we think, okay, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And then we don't worry about it until the day that we take our last breath. But actually each and every step, because the Bible says that a righteous man's steps are ordered by the Lord ordered by the Lord. In other words, he's got a plan for our life, and it's a perfect plan. So Jesus knows the dangers that are waiting for us. So what do we have to fear? I mean, if we're walking with the Lord and he knows what's coming up, what do we have to fear? And one of the best examples I can think of is if there's a minefield out there in a war zone, and somebody knows where those mines are, you'd like to follow that person. That's the safest route through a minefield. And that's exactly what takes place in a walk of faith. Because the devil's out there and he is just setting minds everywhere. Anything he can do to entrap us, to blow us up, to get us off course. Anything he can do to deceive us. And Jesus knows where every single one of those things are. And he will take us out and he will lead us along that path. So Jesus calls us out of our comfort zone. And this is probably the single most difficult thing for us to understand. Is that we want a sense of peace with every step of faith that we take. Oh, the scripture says that he will give us that peace, right? A peace that passes understanding, right? Hello? Does he say that? Sure he does. But he doesn't say that every step of faith is going to be peaceful. At least not initially. You really have to step out first because that first step of faith is a step of courage. Why? 
because it expands our comfort zone. It gets us out of this little trap. And I don't know if you know this, but studies have been done about this, this so-called comfort zone, these, these areas in our life where we feel most comfortable. And what people, what they found out is the, that the more people play it safe, the smaller and smaller that comfort zone gets. And the older that we get, oftentimes that comfort zone shrinks. Which is why in a lot of people in their older age don't even bother to leave their house or their apartment. Because that's the only safe place. And even there they feel in trepidation. And so really to live, I mean to live the way God wants us to live, we've got to get out of that comfort zone. We have to be challenged at the core of our being for everything that we do with Christ. And that's what he does. He calls us out of our comfort zone. Now let's take a look at that windstorm. It's called a great windstorm, not just a little windstorm, okay? Notice that it rose suddenly. There was no forewarning. Jesus didn't prophesy and say, hey, by the way, while we're in the boat, we're going to have a big storm out there, so get ready for it, okay? He didn't say buckle up. He didn't say put on your safety preservers. He didn't say any of that. He simply said, get in the boat, we're going to the other side, and he went to take a nap. And as they got out in the midst of the sea, suddenly this thing arose. And from what I can understand historically about this particular sea, this happens quite often. And these particular storms uh, in the scripture, when you go back to the Greek of that particular word for storm there, it talks about a tempest, like a hurricane. Okay, these are not minor things. These are no small squalls. These are life-threatening events that were ready to flood that boat and kill the people that were in it. This was a serious thing. Now, these were professional fishermen. They knew what they were doing. They were in the middle of a storm, in the middle of an area that they knew where they were, and they, were, they understood it, and they knew that this was a life-threatening thing. So here's the principle behind that. With every breakthrough in your walk of faith, there comes opposition. Expect it. Do not expect to go through this life safely. When you walk with Christ, there's going to be a challenge. There's going to be an opposition. And if there isn't, then you need to question whether or not you're in God's will to start with. Because if it's just so placid and so clear and so comfortable all the time, then you may not be being led of Christ at all. I'll show you from Paul's example here in just a minute what I'm talking about. But you see, what we find is in the midst of this storm that Jesus is in the back of the boat sleeping. You see, Jesus' faith in the Father outweighed any concern for death threats prior to him accomplishing his mission. He knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that his purpose for being on this planet was to die on that cross, to take the sins of this world upon his shoulder, to put them to death, and to be put to death himself as the sacrifice to pay the penalty of God's wrath. To be put into the grave, but not to stay there. To be resurrected and to overcome those things. He knew that. And he knew that the only way that mankind would ever be redeemed from God's wrath would be through that one and only that one approach. He knew that. So why would he worry about a storm in the middle of the sea? That begs the question for us. If we understand our purpose on this planet is to serve God and to serve Him faithfully and to go through every challenge that He puts before us and to overcome every obstacle and to move every mountain that is before us in terms of faith, then why are we worried about it? If Jesus is in our boat, why are we worried about it? And so Jesus slept because he knew he was safe in his Father's care. And we need to understand, we need to take our faith to that next level and understand that we are in his care. John chapter 10, it talks about uh, uh, more specifically this, this understanding that when we are putting our faith in Christ, he says that my people hear my voice and I know them and they know me. He goes on to say in that same chapter that, that uh, the Father has given them to me and I hold them in my hand. And he goes on to say beyond that that my Father, He holds them in His hand. And so if you stop and think about it, you've got the hand of the Son and the hand of the Father wrapped around your soul for eternal security. You've got something there that nothing can ever take you out of. But it's not just someday, by and by, it's now. So His eyes upon the saint, His ears always open to their prayer, always. The scripture says, open to their prayer. Always. Even when you don't know what to pray, the Spirit of God prays for you. So honestly, what have we got to fear? And yet, me included, we fear and we worry about things day after day after day after day. So Jesus slept because he knew he was safe in his Father's care. And in like manner, we need to understand that we are safe in Christ's care. And we need to look at that. 
So let's consider Paul's faith. This is what I was mentioning just a moment ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 down through 28. Verse 23 says, Are they servants of Christ now? Paul was being challenged by people as to whether or not he was an apostle, as to whether or not things counted, uh, what he was said was truly of the doctrine of Christ and things like that. And now he's trying to make his case and he's saying, now, I've, I've gone through all of these things and he's talking about the other apostles and he says, are they, the other apostles, are they servants of Christ? He says, I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I more. He's really trying to make a case here. He says, I more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Now, it's intriguing, that phraseology. Because 40 lashes by the Jews was considered a death sentence. Because with 40 lashes, most of the time, the prisoners would die. That was a capital, it was a capital uh, crime met with a capital... Uh, sorry, capital offense met with a, a capital punishment. And so 40 lashes was intended to kill the prisoner. So it was 40 lashes minus one. Okay, not quite a capital thing, right? I mean, what he's saying here is, I was near death almost every single time. By the way, same number of lashes were given to Christ. Intriguing. But notice that he was lashed five times. That's an outstanding Brutality. If you, if you think just about that one thing. And then he goes on to say in verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers. In danger from bandits. In danger from my fellow Jews. In danger from the Gentiles. In danger in the city. In danger in the country. In danger in the sea. In danger from false believers. You get the sense he was in danger? Verse 27, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and I have been naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. So imagine the pressure that he's under just as an administrator, as an apostle, caring for all of these churches, and then all of the persecution that came on top of him. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think he lived outside his comfort zone a little bit? We break our fingernail and we say, Oh God, why did it happen to me? I can't pay a bill. Oh my God, look at the persecution. <laughs> Thank you, it's a joke. So, <laughs> do we understand that as Americans, we look at this just a little bit differently, right? And yet, we ought to recognize that if we're really living all out for Christ, that there's going to be opposition in our life. There's going to be things that we need to be walking with Christ that he, can, he and He only can walk us through. And so the question came up from those who were in the boat, Teacher, do you not care? You know, our fears manifest in foolish questions like that, don't they? When God's promises should dictate otherwise. You know, a walk of faith, if you use the word faith, what are you really saying? This is what I think a lot of people fail to define in their own walk. Because... A lot of people say, well, I have faith. Well, what kind of faith? Is it blind faith? Is it the kind of faith like, you know, I believe in something that may be immaterial or unreal? Well, I believe in Jesus Christ and I believe in the tooth fairy? Okay, I got faith in the tooth fairy, right? I mean, hang on a minute. What kind of faith are we really talking about? In the Greek, the equivalent word that you could translate faith with is trust. So when it says, I have faith in Jesus Christ, it means I trust him. Well, I trust him with what? Something to happen someday, by and by? Again, it's not something that's going to happen way out in the future. Like when I die, I trust him to take me to heaven. That's not the only aspect of faith. The biggest aspect of faith is when God says what he says that we take it at face value. If there's a promise in scripture that pertains to us as saints, we need to put it to work. That's the walk of faith. And when it says that we may not understand what's going on, we need to back up and say, I don't understand the situation, but I don't care. Whatever God wills for my life, that's what I'm going to accept. Whether it's good or bad in my sight is irrelevant. If I have prayed this thing through and it's still in my face, then I'm going to sit there and I'm going to walk through it with Jesus Christ, no matter what it is. When the scripture says, if you look at a mountain and say that mountain be cast into the sea, and you do it and believe it, Jesus says, it will be done for you. Now, 
I don't know about you, but I've prayed a couple of times. Lord, move that big mountain out there. Okay, now, I haven't seen the Grand Mesa move yet. I'm pretty sure we've still got 50-something 14ers here in this state, so I haven't seen that happen yet. So what is he talking about? He's talking metaphorically, right? In other words, if there's an obstacle that looks so big in your life that you just can't get over it, around it, or dig under it, then pray, and God will remove that thing. I'll give you an example. I have a pastor friend whose wife was in a serious car accident, had brain trauma. She was flight for life over to St. Mary's. And I knew the uh, attending physician, I knew the surgeon that was going to do the brain operation. She had such traumatic brain injury that by the time I got there, the prognosis was she would die within a few hours. That was a prognosis. The doctor whom I knew, that he said he was a Christian, and he invited us in. He says, we just really need to pray. He says, I'll do the surgery, but we've got to wait for the, for the, for the uh, swelling to go down and do various other things. He says, but we all just need to gather and pray. So we did. We gathered and we prayed around uh, the bed. We got together. We put this out for all the prayer uh, lines that we could get our hands on. Everybody that we know of was praying. And so he did the surgery. He had to remove a piece of the skull so that the swelling would go down. And so as the swelling began to go down, things she didn't die that night. And she maintained it through the next day. And then she didn't die the next night. And so we were really thinking maybe the Lord's going to bring her through. And so we asked the doctor, well, now what's the prognosis? He says, well, if she lives, she'll be a vegetable the rest of her life. No doubt about it. If she lives, she'll probably never move again. He says, I've never seen a traumatic brain injury like this that didn't result in death. So we kept praying. And we kept praying. And we kept praying. And God answered those prayers. Within two weeks, she walked out of the hospital. Within six months, she was back to normal. She had no paralysis, no speech impediment, no other injuries. Now what I'm telling you is there's a mountain in the way. And God answers prayer. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the kind of faith that we ought to have. That's the kind of faith that we need to be always going to God and simply saying, Lord, do you care? And of course He does. You see, our fears manifest in foolish questions. But God's promises give us the way, don't they? If we just rely on what God says, if He says, ask and you will receive, don't you think He means it? Or do you think He just put it in the book to make us feel good? Of course not. He's the God of all things. He's sovereign over all things. And so we ask, ask such questions when we focus on the storm instead of on the Savior. And when we do, we walk headlong into doubt. You see, the next phrase we want to look at is when Christ rebuked the wind and the waves. He said, peace, be still. You see, Christ cares. He did not wake up grouchy. Right? I wake up grouchy from a nap. Somebody, some dog puts his cold, wet nose on me and I wake up. I was like, get out of here, you stupid dog. Go away. And I try to roll over and go back to sleep. Or my wife says, hey, uh, come uh, clean the floor or something like that. Oh, I'm sleeping, honey. I don't want to get up right now. Right? But I don't wake up saying, oh, yeah, let's just go do this floor, okay? <laughs> Re revelation into my life, right? Um, <laughs> but understand that Jesus didn't wake up grouchy, did he? Okay? And when we go to the Savior, he doesn't sleep through situations, okay? When we go to Nepal, and I've seen these uh, Buddhist temples and things like that, they have bells in these Buddhist temples. And I always wondered what those bells were about. So I asked somebody who was there, uh, he was a Christ follower, and he told me about the religion that he had come out of, the Buddhist religion. And he said, it's because the Buddhist gods sometimes are asleep, they need to ring the bell to wake them up. Our God's not that way. The Bible says he never sleeps, he never slumbers. In other words, he never tires. And if we come to him in prayer, Christ cares. He cares so much that his eyes are always upon the saints. His ears are always open to our prayers. So this miracle that we see in Scripture manifests Christ's care and compassion for human need, as well as a sovereign control over the natural systems and the events that directly affect his chosen ones. We have a big brother, if you want to look at it that way, in Christ. Who cares about us? We have a Father in our Heavenly Father who cares. So then Christ asks a question. Why are you so fearful? This is a good and logical question. They were in the midst of a storm. No doubt it was life uh, periling. No, it was perilous, right? It was, it was something that was definitely going to kill them. 
They had the right to be fearful. But they also had the right to lean on faith. When Jesus was sleeping in the stern, that should have given an indication to them that he wasn't worried about it. Why should I? And so this is a good and logical question. Bless you. <clears throat> are, why are you fearful? If Jesus was in the boat with you, what do you have to fear? And I think oftentimes for us, it's that we don't walk close enough to Christ to know his presence. We get up in the morning, we shuffle off to work or school or wherever it is that we go in the mornings, and we forget about prayer, we forget about reading the scripture, we forget about time spent with Christ, we forget about just being in Christ, and we start launching off on our day. It's not that we mean to, it just happens. I mean, busy, we got busy lives. But when that happens, and something occurs in our life to wake us up, then we start asking those doubting questions. Does he care? Is he there? What happens if dot, dot, dot? You can fill it in the blank yourself, right? And these are the questions that we start asking because we don't see his presence anymore. Our prayers seem not to get any further than the ceiling. So he asks the question, why are you so fearful? Just because we don't immediately see Jesus making an end to our dilemmas doesn't imply that he doesn't care. It only means that he's at work behind the scenes in the, uh, on the situation, even if we don't see or experience that work ourselves. Now think about the ramifications of changing one event, just one event. If there's a situation that is a dilemma in our life, a hardship, something that comes into our life that is very, very difficult, and we begin to pray about that. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus immediately hears that. And in his own will, in his own timing, if it is appropriate, he begins working behind the scenes. And he starts setting up the pieces so that everything works out together for good to those who love Christ. Now imagine that on a scale of millions of believers and all of the requests and all of the things that are going on. And yet it doesn't, he doesn't even break a sweat doing it. That's amazing stuff to me. But we need to keep that in our heart if we're going to understand this idea of faith. So how is it that you have no faith? This is the next question that he asks his disciples. This is the real question. The other one was a good question, but this is a real question. Why, when the very promises of God are so near to us, must we insist on filling in our lack of understanding with a negative? It's human nature, isn't it? We got a question mark that lays out there in the future and immediately we fill it in with a negative. We're driving down the road and things go dark and it's starting to rain. What's going to happen? I think we're going to get into an accident. You just filled it in with a negative. Why can't you just say, well, I'm going to be a better driver as a result? That sounds more positive, right? But it is true. It's human nature. But that's also the fallen nature. And really, if we have the kind of faith that I think the Bible describes that we can possibly have, then we need to be looking at those things in the future and saying, I wonder how God's going to handle this. Right? Wouldn't that be a more positive way to address things in the future? Like I said a moment ago, faith means trust. Jesus is asking in that question, why don't you trust me now? How is it that you have no faith? He's really saying, why don't you trust me now? What circumstances have changed that you now don't trust me anymore? And that's a real challenge for us. One commentator put it this way. Speaking of the author of the book of Mark, he says, Mark likely intended to indicate that faith is more than intellectual assent. That it is trust in a person. That's why I said faith is not just something, you know, faith is in an object. Faith is in a person. And if we put our faith in Jesus Christ and He says that I will never leave you nor forsake you, if He promises to be with us until the end of the age, if He says that if you ask, you will receive, if you knock, the door will be open, that if you seek for something, you will find it, these are all indicatives. They are things that are going to happen. It's, in, it's indicative of His nature. He's saying you can trust Me. You can have faith in Me. He says, in fact, you can trust Me more than your own understanding. That's how we need to be looking at faith. This kind of faith Jesus' original disciples should have had and all subsequent disciples should have. In other words, us. We should have that kind of faith. The entire story reassured the believers who had already experienced popular abuse and were facing the prospect of official 
persecution. Although Jesus may not always appear to be present or to care, he will deliver his people who are in various kinds of trouble. Therefore, his disciples should never doubt. And I'll tell you what, the one thing that our arch enemy has more than anything else done to us as believers is to sow the seeds of doubt. That is what knocks us off course every single time. So when Jesus asks the questions, why are you fearful? We should take that to heart. We should seriously consider that in our own lives. What is it that causes me fear? And secondly, why is it that you have no faith? I personally believe it all boils down to one word. Doubt. Sometimes we doubt he can do it. Sometimes he do we doubt that he will do it. Sometimes we doubt that he will do it for us. It's one thing to read about a miracle taking place or to hear about a miracle taking place, but it's another thing to accept the miracle for yourself. To say Christ is willing and capable to do it for me. Now, does this mean that every prayer that you throw up there is going to get a positive answer? No. Okay, I don't believe in this whole mentality of, of uh, name it and claim it. Okay, it's not in Scripture. But if you pray like Jesus prayed and say, Father, if it's your will, this is what I desire, then without a doubt, He will answer it. And God always answers prayer in one of three ways. Yes, no, or wait. And the first two, you'll know the answer. If you pray for something, the answer is yes, ding, you got it, right? If you pray for something and you don't get it, ding, you don't get it, the answer is no. But if the answer is wait, then the scripture teaches us that we should keep doing the last thing that we know God told us to do. Keep doing it, stay faithful at it. One of those mountains that we have is the salvation of our loved ones, friends and family. And I'll tell you what, when we pray and we don't see them coming to the Lord and we continue to pray, I prayed for well over 15 to 18 years for my mom to come to the, to the Lord. She finally did. There are many others who I've been praying for. So I still don't have that answer for you, but I'm going to continue to pray until either they're dead or I'm dead. But if he says, wait, we just keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Because he never gets tired of the prayers of the saints. So here's a way to get over the doubt once and for all. Never doubt again. Here's, here's, here it is. Are you ready? Take a notes. Hope you're ready. Matthew 14, verses 28 through 33. Here's the second incident where there's a boat with disciples in it on a stormy sea. And they're out there and Jesus said, you go to the other side and I'll meet you over there. So they struck off, they got in the middle of the ocean, another one of these tempests comes up, they're about to drown, and here's this big thing, and they see this really weird thing happening out there, some guys walking on the water. And they freak out, oh, it's a ghost, it's something else, and Jesus says, ah, just back up, it's me, it's okay, peace, you know, just, just don't worry about it, I need a ride, here I come, okay, he's walking over to them, and Peter, this guy's got faith, right? He says, Lord, if it's you... Tell me to come to you on the water. Now that's faith. Because I know physically you can't really walk on water very well, even though Jesus did it really well, right? But Peter's saying, hey, I mean, it is not my first impulse in a stormy sea where I'm about to drown to jump out of the boat and walk in the water. It's not my first impulse. But Peter, that's his first impulse. Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. End of story, right? What happened? Okay, as he was walking on the water, yeah, everybody knows the rest of the story. <laughs> All right, so that's the end of the sermon. Thank you. No, uh, every he got as he was walking on the water. Notice what it says. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. What happened? He took his eye off the Lord. He jumped down out of the boat. He took a few steps. Now, get the story here. It was a storm. All of the pictures that you, you know, artist renderings that you see of this, because there's no actual pictures. <laughs> yeah, right. So all the, uh, all the pictures that you see of this is like, you know, he's jumping out of the boat and there's these little waves that are flopping back and forth. No, this is a storm that's sinking the boat. So imagine getting out of a sinking boat, like, you know, doing this major heave-ho stuff, and you jump out of the boat onto the water, and the water's doing the big old heave-ho stuff, and you're walking on that big old heave-ho stuff out towards the... Lord, and you're walking towards him, and you say, wow, this is really cool. And I'll say, this is impossible. Kadoom. 
right? What happened? He took his eyes off the Lord. And so he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. End of story, right? No, what happened? Look at the next word. This is a cool word. Immediately. Jesus did not stand there with his hands on his hips saying, well, I told you so. Okay, it's impossible. You shouldn't have done it, you dummy. Okay, he didn't say that. He didn't scold him for a lack of faith. He didn't do anything. What did he do? Immediately, Jesus reached out, grabbed his hand, and caught him. I want you to think about that the next time you're in a storm. Seriously. I want you to envision that. Because when you cry out to Jesus, what does he do? He immediately answers your prayer, man. You may not see it. You may not understand it. But if he says in John chapter 10 that he's got you in his hand, it's just like Peter. You've got to understand that. It's hard. I mean, it is hard for me to grasp that in the midst of a really difficult time. It's hard. And I complain and I mully grub and I do all sorts of funny things except just accept the fact that I'm in his hand. And so I imagine if I struggle with it, then a lot of us struggle with it too, right? So he says, immediately he reached out and he caught him. And then he said, you of little faith, why did you... What's the next word? Doubt. doubt. Why did you doubt? And when he climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, the first instance happened early in the disciples' walk with Christ. And this instance was much later in the disciples' walk. What was the change of attitude? First they said, Well, who is this man who can control the wind and the waves? I don't understand who this is. Strange dude. But then they say, truly, this is the Son of God. So you see the confirmation that these difficult times bring you through? It transforms you from somebody that says, I'm not sure who God is. And you walk as a little child would walk, a toddler, barely able to walk, clinging onto the Savior's hands, to a place where you're finally able to run in the freedom that is in Christ, only to stumble now and again. And Jesus immediately picks you right back up again. And you are there then praising Him. But it's with, if you don't have those difficult times, you don't grow in faith. Which is why you can't stay in your comfort zone. You can't be scared to walk out on faith. You can't be afraid to share your faith with other people. You just have to walk in that faith and in that power. So, here's the formula. Never doubt again. Ask yourself the question, where's my focus? If you're keeping your eyes on the Savior, then you're going to be like Jesus walking on, or on, uh, Peter walking on the water. But if not, if you've got your eyes on the situation, that's when doubt creeps in. That's when it's really difficult. So I'm going to end with this monumental discovery that I had one time. I was out. Did you like that? Get the echo. Ooh. Um, <clears throat> I asked a friend of mine if he would take me out climbing one time. We went out to Independence Rock and we climbed that rock. I, ever since I was a teenager, I looked at that rock and I thought, man, I just I got to stand on top of that someday. So thankfully this guy took me out there. And I was really rusty. I hadn't climbed for a number of years. And so my friend took me out there. We got up to that mushroom cap up on the top. And most of you probably know what Independence Rock looks like. And it's got a mushroom cap up on the top. And there's been so many climbers up there uh, through so many years that the holes that were drilled in there from the original pipes that were put in, like for handrails and stuff like that, they're all like worn out and they're sloped and they got lots of you know junk in them and there's dust and they're not very good for handholds, they're not very good for footholds. So I'm, I'm up there and this is the crux of the climb. I have done everything else to the best of my ability all the way up until this one point. I was feeling really good and I'm thinking, man, I just can't wait. So try to imagine, okay, like this is the outcrop right here, okay, and it sits back about three feet under, and then I'm standing there, and I got my toe on one side, and I got my uh, other toe over here, and I'm holding this hole underneath here, and I'm reaching up, and my buddy's up on top, and he's, and he's belaying me up with the rope. And I'm trying to reach up over the top, and he says there's a handhold up there, just a few more inches, man, just a few more inches, I'm reaching and reaching and reaching, I can't find it. I start getting the jitters, okay? My calves start going crazy. I said, no, man, i got to sit back. So I sat back for a few minutes. I shook everything out. I said, okay, I'm ready to go again. So he said, climb on. So I'm climbing. I can't reach, can't reach it. And then about the third time I did that, my foot slipped and I fell. And I dropped about four feet or three feet on that rope. And it, you know, you know how those ropes kind of expand. I'm hanging about four, 520 feet up in the air looking over the edge. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I could die. 
And I wasn't saying that in any vain way. I was talking, oh my God, help me, I could die. That was my prayer. The only thing I could say, oh, Jesus. That's all that came out, man. And I was suspended there. And I thought, I've failed. I can't get up this thing. I tried three or four more times. I was so tired by the time that I was done, I couldn't do it. I started making up excuses and I started apologizing. I started saying how bad that, uh, of a situation this was. And I kept telling this friend that I was with, his name was Rick. I said, Rick, I'm so sorry that I brought you up here. Now I can't make the crux. And he would look over the top and he would look at me and says, Hey, bud, I'll get you up here. And then all of a sudden there was an epiphany. That's exactly what Jesus does for us. When we get in a situation where we can't go any higher, we've got no strength, and all we got left is that little thin rope of faith. He leans over the top and says, I got you. I got you, man. Have no worries. I'll get you up here. And you know what? This guy, he put together this uh, uh, pulley system. And I'm, I'm a 200 and some pound guy. And you can fill in the question mark. I'm a 200 and some pound guy. And for this guy who is maybe 160 pounds to pull me up, all I needed was like two inches. It took him 45 minutes to rig it up and get me up those two inches. And when I finally found what they call a thank God hold, I found that puppy. And I flashed the rest of it. I got my strength back. I got my faith back. I got all encouraged about it. And I stood on top of that little piece of rock, which sounds really stupid. It's just a piece of rock, right? But it was such an achievement for me. And I believe that that's how God leads us in our faith and walk. I had to get out of my comfort zone. I had to be willing to take the risk. And it was him looking over the top, encouraging me the whole time. Don't worry about it. I got you. We'll get you up there. So the next time you go through something hard, the next time you think about your own faith, the next time God challenges you to witness to somebody, get out of that comfort zone, man. That's the best place to be. Because you can sleep in the back of a sinking ship with that kind of faith. Thank you, guys.